Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here at Foothills Online. My name is Blaine. I'm one of the pastors, and I'm thrilled that you are checking us out today. If this is your very first time tuning in, a special thank you to you. There's lots of different churches you could choose from. You chose Foothills, and we're so happy that you did. We want to connect with you. What we'd love for you to do, if you type in in the comment section below, if you're watching on, on Facebook, we have online moderators that will see your comment, that will reach back out to you. And you can also, if you have something you'd like prayer for or have any questions about the church, type it right there in the comment. We have online moderators that would love to get back with you there. A couple big announcements. Here on March 19th, Sunday, March 19th, from 12.30 to 1.30, we are having our next gathering. And if you're not familiar with what that is, that class, that lunch is for anybody who is relatively new to our faith family that would love to know all things Foothills Church. You'll get to hear from our lead pastors. You'll get to hear um, where God has brought us from, where he's taking us. You'll get to meet all the people on staff, hear how you can get connected and get involved. And so if you're new or if you'd love to hear more about Foothills, that would be a great thing for you to attend. We provide lunch. We provide child care. Again, that's on Sunday, March 19th from 1230 to 130. Also, the very next week on Sunday, March 26th, we are having our 25th year anniversary. We are blown away by God's goodness over these first 25 years of Foothills, and we are so excited for the next 25 years. This big party, it's from four to eight. We're going to have live music, food trucks, all kinds of games. Um, there's going to be lawnmower races. It's going to be just a, a ton of fun. And also later that evening, we're going to have fireworks. And again, this is all just to give God glory and celebrate what he has done and just to push us forward into the next 25 years. So we hope that you can um, join us for that as well. And finally, today we're going to be continually continuing our what did or did God really say sermon series. This is a short two-week series. Last week, uh, Pastor Greg talked about abortion. He did an amazing job. This week, today, Pastor Kevin is going to be talking about homosexuality. And I want to let you know this now, just in case you may have uh, children that might be in the room with you. If you're a parent and you may not want to have them sit in on this sermon, we just want to be hospitable and let you know that that's the topic matter for you today. Kevin's going to do a great job, uh, but we just want to let you know that. So guys, with that, grab your Bible, grab some coffee. We hope that you enjoy the service, and we'll chat with you after.
Good morning, Foothills. Will you stand and join me in worship this morning? I am so grateful for the opportunity to gather together in freedom and freely worship God. I love getting the chance to thank Him for what He's done in my life and celebrate, but also I just love remembering. And I pray this morning that you can just stop and remember what God has delivered you from and brought you out of. Oh, I won't forget the wonder of how you
Good morning, Foothills. Let's give it up for our worship team. You guys can take a seat for just a moment. If you haven't met me yet, my name is Sharon Nicholson. I am our worship director here at Foothills. If this is your first Sunday in the building, we just wanna welcome you. We would love for you to stop by our guest room on your way out at the front of the concourse. We would just love for you to have an opportunity to meet some of our staff, meet some of our volunteers. We wanna answer any questions that you have, any questions that you may have about getting plugged in beyond a Sunday morning, or if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear those as well. And then we're going to send you home with a free gift, just our way of saying thank you for being here today. Um, So today we are wrapping up the last um, week of our series, Did God Really Say? Um, We mentioned this last week, but I wanted to give you an opportunity again. The message today is going to be a little heavier. It's going to be on um, a little heavier topic. We want to give you the opportunity, if you haven't already, to check your kids into Kids Zone or Planet Kids. This might be a topic today that you'll want to discuss with them one on one. So again, you still have time. I want to give you that opportunity to do that if you feel that is what's best for you and your family. We have a few things coming up that I want to share quickly with you. On March 19th, we are having our next class. A lot of you have probably attended that already. There are several of you that maybe haven't attended that yet. I'm gonna tell you why you need to come. Number one, free food. Yes. Number two, free childcare. Yes. And number three, you get to hear from all of our ministry leaders about the opportunities we have to get you plugged in, whether that's with worship, our kids ministry, guest experience, our tech team. You'll get to hear about serve opportunities that maybe you did not know even existed. You'll get to hear about our connect groups, different ways that you can get plugged in there as well. And that's, again, going to be next Sunday. It's right after our second service. You can just kind of hang around, go to that. Um, And then on the 26th, March 26th, we are having our 25-year celebration. Yes. We are so excited to celebrate 25 years of Pastor Greg and Liz saying yes to the call God placed on their lives. We are inviting you to the services that morning so that we can encourage them and pray over them in their next journey. But also, we want to pray over Pastor Kevin and Katie as they continue this journey for our next 25 years. So we want you to be here that Sunday morning, but we want to invite you back that evening at 4 p.m. And this is this is for you guys. We're going to have food. We're going to have live music and games and, yes, lawnmower races and fireworks. It's going to be incredible. So we want to see you back here at 4 p.m. that evening. We are going to have an incredible time. And guys, we're able to do stuff like this because of your generosity. We get to have a party in the pasture because of your generosity. But even more important than that, we are making an impact on our community. Your generosity has made an impact for the last 25 years, and it will continue to make an impact for the next 25 years. And for that, we just want to say thank you. Um, I do want to remind you of the three ways you can give this morning, online, through our app, or in the offer box on your way out. If you guys will go ahead and stand back up, we are going to continue into worship, and I'm going to pray over us as we do that. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to just be in your house this morning. Lord, thank you so much for a church that knows your mission matters. People matter, and we are just Lord, we're pressing forward to help people find and follow you. So Jesus, we just pray this morning as we hear this message, as we sing these songs, Lord, that we just hear your truth, but we feel your love more than anything. And we pray all these things in your name. Amen. I've been held in your hands 
From the moment that I wake up until I lay in my head, I will sing of the goodness of God.
into the light of grace, just like Lazarus. Oh, you brought me back to life. Where there was dead religion, now there is living faith. All of my hope and freedom are found in Jesus' name, just like Lazarus. you've done for me Jesus to fully praise you it will take all eternity just like Lazarus oh you brought me back to life
Come on, every voice in here, let's sing that one more time. No longer I do it, but Christ in me, just like that. Again, my heart is free. The hope of heaven before me, the grave behind. Hallelujah, you brought me back to life. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you for this salvation, God. Thank you that you came to us and you met us exactly where we were. Thank you that you gave your life, God, so that we may have ours. God, please be with us in this room this morning as we have a hard conversation, but one that's way overdue. Please be with Kevin this morning with this message. Amen. Foothills, how we doing? Good, good, good. Hey, can we say thanks to the worship team? That was awesome. Awesome time of worship. So I think it was about a month ago, Katie and I got home on a Sunday afternoon from church about the same time, and she said, Kevin, I need to tell you what happened today. It's like, okay. We've got two daughters, Haley and Anna. Haley's four. Anna is just about to be two, which is crazy to think about. Uh, she said, so Anna was in Discovery Kids, and there was a, a new boy that Anna had hung out with that morning. She had gotten well acquainted with. This boy was awesome. I think he was just a little bit older than Anna, so he was kind of showing her the ropes, and they had just a, a great connection. And uh, Katie shows up, and normally when we show up, if Anna sees us, I mean, she's got one thing on mind. She wants to come to daddy or come to mommy. That's it. Like, she's ready to go. But this particular day, she started to walk towards Katie and this boy, who I'm gonna leave unnamed just to be kind to him, he goes, he goes, oh, Anna, can I have a kiss? And, and it was sweet, yeah, sweet, kind of. Anna, <laughs> Anna turns around, walks right up, and lays a wet one right on his lips, y'all. Right on it. Katie's telling me this, my eyes twitching, you know? And I said, that's it. We're gonna sit down as a church and we're having a sex talk right now. That is what's gonna happen. So that is the start of why this conversation is happening. No, kidding. Uh, Pastor Greg and I shared at the end of last fall, we know that there are conversations and topics that our world is talking about, and they're harder topics to bring up because they can be divisive uh, in nature because of the way that our culture is interacting with them, but they're important topics, and they're topics that God wasn't silent on, and so the church shouldn't be silent. And I share that story about Anna uh, to say, yes, maybe this didn't, wasn't rooted in a situation that happened with my daughters, but this conversation is rooted in the fact that my daughters and, and your children and the next generation deserves a church who's gonna open the Bible and say, here's what God's word says about these difficult truths. Because the reality is the world is not waiting on the church to go ahead and share its ideas and ideals out there. And so we're, we're gonna open up and have a tough conversation, but just like last week, I wanna invite us to enter into this conversation with, with two hands. I think we need both hands today in this conversation. I think that we need one hand grabbing a hold of grace today. That we need God's grace for how we interact with this truth we need God's grace in us, we need God's grace for us, and we need God's grace through us as a church. But we need another hand that's grabbing a hold of truth. We need to know what God's truth is, what God has said about truth, and, and ultimately who God is because God is truth. And so we're, we're gonna need both because we're gonna talk about 
the definition of marriage, of sex, and of sexuality. And when we, when we open this conversation today, you know this, that definition in our world, outside of these walls, that definition is a moving target. Like the definition of marriage, of sex, and of sexuality, especially in the last 50 years in our country, has been evolving and changing over the course of time. And, and not only has it been evolving, but it's become an extremely divisive topic, a divisive definition. Political parties have divided over this definition. Culture has divided over this definition. And it's seeped into the church. Denominations of the church have divided over beliefs on the definition of marriage, sex, and sexuality. And that's, that's just corporate gatherings. The reality is, it's not just out there in our big gatherings, it's, it's, it's close to home too. It's in your families and it's in my families where this definition is causing division and, and struggle and tension. And it's because, again, it's a moving target. And so I wanna start today by saying, I get for a couple of reasons why the target or the definition or the moral line, if you will, has easily moved. You see, when, when, when you compromise a little bit or move a moral line a little bit out to a further rung from the truth, when you take one step, the next step doesn't seem so crazy or so far anymore. And so you can easily kind of evolve in what you think or believe about truth. And so when our world plays with this idea of how God designed marriage and how God designed sex, it's always gonna start with small steps. Like, wait a minute. I know that God designed maybe sex for, for a man and woman together in marriage, but why wait? I mean, I'm committed in this relationship. We're in a committed relationship. Why wait until we've taken that step to be in a covenant relationship? And so there's a little bit of a step. Oh, and by the way, if it's, if it's not just for once we get married, well, well, shouldn't I find out if this partner is the right one for me? And, and why, why do I need to limit this to, to one person? And so there's, a, there's another step. Oh, and by the way, if, if, if I was able to be that free with this decision before marriage, well, now after married, um, you know, what's to stop me from, from continuing to explore what I feel, what I feel like I want and what I would like? And there, there's another moral step. Oh, and then, hey, if, if there's really not boundaries around who or how many, why are there boundaries around whether it's the opposite sex or if it's the same sex? And there's, a, there's another one. Do you, see, do you see how easily it is to start moving? And then once we go there, if it doesn't matter if it's opposite sex or same sex, what does it matter what sex I am? Like, what does that matter? If, can't I decide what I feel like I should be? Our world is just is taking step after step after step to where that moral line has shifted quickly. But the second reason I understand why that definition is a moving target is because probably like many of you, I've got people in my life that I love very much. I've got family members and I've got close friends who I love very much that did not wake up one day hoping they would have desires outside of God's design for sex and for marriage not waking up one day saying, I hope that I could be attracted to someone of the same sex. I hope that I could have these feelings that, that drive me away from, from God's design or that call me away from God's design. And they can't just like on a whim change what's going on internally with these thoughts, these attractions, these feelings. And as a result, when I'm confronted with this with loved ones, I have to take a step back and, 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 and stop and say, wait a minute, why is that person feeling that? What do I believe about this now? God, I know what your word says, but is that truth? I gotta wrestle with whether or not this is true because, because I also know that what, what my loved family member, what my loved friend is feeling, it's true to them. It's very real to them. And so it's easy for this moral line to have moved. And that's why, church, we need grace and truth. Because honestly, the church as a whole has taken approaches where they only had one hand involved. There's been churches and Christians 
who've grabbed a hold of truth and they've left grace behind. And for my loved ones and your loved ones, they've heaped shame and guilt and brokenness on them. People that I love very much, and more importantly, people that God loves very much, that God created, that God is crazy about. But also, there are people who've taken a hand in grace and they've left truth behind. And church, when you leave truth behind, you may go to what feels right now, but later it leads to shame and guilt and brokenness because the truth is where freedom is. The Bible says that the truth will set you free. So church, we need grace and freedom for this conversation. So before we open the word together, I wanna invite us. Would you put out two hands with me and we're gonna pray. Open hands, okay? if you're willing. And I want, I want, I'm gonna pray this, but I wanna invite you to make this the prayer of your heart, if you are willing. That asking God, genuinely asking God for both grace and truth. Can we pray together? God, we desperately need your grace and we need you to show us your truth. We believe that you are the truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. What we're gonna do is we're gonna look at a couple of passages from the New Testament that show us where we should get our baseline for truth on this topic. Then we're going to look at that baseline for truth and then I've got a special guest today that's gonna share a testimony that that is gonna be very, very powerful. So if you've got your Bibles, let's go to Matthew chapter 19. It'll be on the screens. We're gonna start at verse four. To set the scene, um, there's a conversation that Jesus was having and some religious experts were asking him questions about divorce. In fact, actually what they were doing is they were in this conversation where they were trying to trip Jesus up. And fun fact, when you go through the gospels and religious experts, they like to try to trip Jesus up. Often, you're not gonna win a theology debate with Jesus, just, just saying. But they ask him about divorce because Moses had allowed divorce in Israel's history. And so they were curious about this. So start reading how Jesus responds. He says, haven't you read the scriptures? Jesus replied, they record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Now real quick, what Jesus is doing, he's quoting the second page of the Bible. He is quoting Genesis 2. He is quoting the creation story where God introduces this idea of male and female joining together to become one. He is introducing sex and marriage. This is where God introduced it. And Jesus is saying, I'm gonna point all the way back here. And so it caused them to, to ask questions. Let's keep reading verse seven, or sorry, verse six. Since they are no longer two, but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. So they're asking, then why did Moses say in the law that a man could give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts, but it was not what God had originally intended. In other words, there was a moral line, a definition that Israel had had changed. And what Jesus was saying is that was the result of people fighting back against their leader, Moses. This was not God changing or shifting a moral line that he once created. What was happening here was cultural pressure affected a moral line. Let me say that again. Cultural pressure, these hard hearts, this culture was affecting the way that Moses and the leaders and Israel interacted with this moral line, this definition of God's design for marriage and for sex. And what Jesus was doing is he was saying, I don't want you to look back to what Moses did and what culture did. I want you to look further than that to the beginning to God to find out what God really intended. What Moses or what Jesus is saying here is our first point today for a baseline for truth. Culture does not determine truth. So what Jesus is saying, culture does not determine truth. I know there was cultural pressure. I know that it affected things, but that's not where we find truth on what God's design for this was. The second place in the New Testament I wanna look is a writing from Paul. Now, Paul is an apostle that was radically transformed by Jesus. Then he went on 
three incredible missionary journeys. He planted a ton of churches. A lot of the New Testament are letters that he wrote. And Paul talked about sex and marriage in a lot of his letters. And he directly talked about same-sex behavior or homosexuality in three of his letters, in Romans, in Corinthians, and in Timothy. And Paul has a conversation where he describes what happens when a group of people choose to abandon the way God created them to be, to choose to follow what their hearts desired, and kind of the, the craziness that ensues as people engage in this. Let's look at Romans chapter one, starting at verse 24. It says, so God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise, amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Paul shares that people had abandoned the beginning, the creator, and what the order that God created for our romantic relationships to be. They had abandoned that, and he said they followed their heart's desires. What that means is they followed their feelings. They followed what they felt to be true. What Paul was displaying right here is our second baseline for truth. Guys, feelings do not determine truth. Feelings do not determine truth. Culture doesn't determine truth. Feelings do not determine truth. Paul's saying, look, I know that people are following their heart desires. This is what they feel. But Paul also, by pointing to the creator, is also pointing all the way back to the beginning. He's pointing back to page two, to creation. For us to get a definition from the creator himself for marriage and sex and sexuality. And I think that it was so intentional that Jesus and Paul pointed all the way back to the beginning. You see, if you read a lot of the New Testament, the Old Testament is quoted often in the New Testament. Jesus quoted passages from the Old Testament. Paul quoted passages from the Old Testament. But I find it interesting that in this conversation, they didn't go back and quote something that Moses wrote in one of the books of the law. They didn't go back and quote something that David wrote in one of the Psalms. They didn't go back and quote something in one of the major prophets like Isaiah or Jeremiah. They said, no, we're gonna go all the way back so that you can't even confuse what was going on in the context of history at that point. Like this, is, this cannot be argued with as we go all the way back to our creator. And the reality is they had to do this because people were twisting the context of what was going on. You just saw it. People were twisting the context of what divorce was and when, how they could interact with divorce. They were taking something that God had intended and they were twisting it based on cultural pressure or based on their feelings. And the same is happening today. And church, I, almost, I, I wanna warn you. Like if you were to go and research or try to study what, what truth is from God's word, about the biblical definition of marriage, sex, and sexuality, you're gonna get a wide variety of beliefs out there. Even from churches, from pastors who are taking scripture and guys, they're bending it to the cultural pressure or they're bending it to their feelings. There's a whole, there's a whole sect of theology known as gay theology, which is, it is growing. What they're doing is they're taking passages that we've talked about here they're taking things like a passage where King David, you remember he had a best friend named Jonathan? We talked about them last summer. King David and Jonathan had an incredible friendship. This gay theology is pushing that, that Jonathan and David were involved romantically. The scriptures don't say that. This is someone twisting to feel good about the direction they wanna go. Or you'll see, there, you'll see ideas out there that any time that same-sex behavior, homosexual activity is mentioned in the Bible, that it's only referring to cases of rape or pedophilia. Now, I will say that's in here and, and God condemns that, that behavior as well. 
And he speaks against that. But, but the, the acts that we just read that Paul talked about and in his other two spots in Corinthians and in Timothy, where he talks about same-sex behavior, he is not putting any age on this. And there's no discussion about rape. This is people bending things to, to try and cause scripture to fit the lifestyle that they want. They're following culture or they're following their feelings. There is danger in this. And Jesus and Paul both pointed back to the beginning because they wanted us to know the baseline for truth. And that's point three today. God determines truth. God determines truth. He is the truth. God determines it. Culture does not determine truth. Feelings do not determine truth. God determines truth. So let's open up Genesis chapter two and let's look at God's truth. In the story of creation, you're gonna see a story where God introduces things that are opposite but go together. Things that were different but they were similar that go together to make the whole picture. God creates day and he creates night. God creates heaven and he creates earth. He creates land and he creates sea. He creates man and he creates woman. Genesis 2 verse 18 says, then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper who is just right for him. Can I get an amen, men? That's right. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. As I read this, just, this is so cool, you guys. Don't let the wonder of how cool this is slip right past your eyes as I read this. Maybe you've heard this passage a thousand times before. Don't let the wonder of this. The Lord God caused the man to fall into deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out of one of the man's ribs, closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib. And he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. God introduces these, these beings, human beings that are similar but different, opposite but go together. God introduces us to marriage and to sex right here. And I wanna just kind of do a quick flyover of the biblical purposes for sex. The guys are gonna throw it on the screen. We don't have time to, to dive into this all the way, but I've put some passages for you to be able to do some homework later. If you wanna come back and, and rewatch this section, you could go and read these scriptures. If you start in Genesis and go throughout, you will see four purposes for sex and you need all four to follow what God designed sex to be. Some people will take a couple and, and, and push a couple away, but that's not what God designed. There's to reproduce, Genesis 1, is to be fruitful and multiply. God could have populated the earth himself, but he gave us that privilege, how incredible. So purpose one, reproduce. Purpose two, pleasure. I asked the guys to put up praise hand emojis right there, but they said that was too much, so. Um, but praise God, this is a gift that he's given us. And if you haven't read the Song of Solomon, it can spice up your marriage. Number three, becoming one flesh. This is what we just were introduced to. This is so much more than physical. Like the original language, what God was introducing, this was physical, spiritual, emotional, mental. This is two souls joining together. We have a world that's trying to teach teach the next generation especially about how to be able to engage in sexual behavior but not harm their bodies. It's safe sex, right? That's being pushed. I want you to hear me, church. God did not create sex to be safe. It is a dangerous force on purpose. It is a beautiful force that God created so that two souls could become one. The only safe place for that dangerous activity is in a committed relationship between one man and one woman. And then the fourth is showing Christ's love for the church, Ephesians 5. Paul talks all about this. Our, our mission and vision here at Foothills is to help people find and follow Jesus. And I think it's amazing that, that God allows our marriages to be an example of that. We get to help people find and follow Jesus. Husbands, you get to help people find and follow Jesus by loving your wives in the way that Jesus loves the church. That is our 
our, our model. That's our beacon that we are looking towards. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Again, you can kind of trail that a little farther. And so I want to I want to throw up real quick just a biblical truth for sex and marriage that's simply stated. Marriage and sex is created to be between one man and one woman in a monogamous covenant relationship ordained by God. Say it again. Marriage and sex is created to be between one man and one woman in a monogamous covenant relationship ordained by God. We recognize that ordination process as two people come together in front of witnesses. They make vows of a commitment and a covenant that they're making before others, and before God. This is the wedding day, the marriage license that takes place. It's recognized by the state as such. This is what a committed marriage, this is what God designed for two to become one. And remember Jesus said, let no man split apart what God brought together. This is the biblical definition of sex and marriage. But the reality is, culture is introducing us to different ideas that we feel like we should follow. You see, page two, God introduces truth. Page three, the serpent shows up. And he shows up to Eve after God's given them instructions. Hey, you may eat from any of the fruit except this one tree. And what does the serpent start with? He starts with a question. He starts by saying, wait a minute, did God really say? Like, is that really what's true? Is that really what's best for you? Are you really gonna trust that what God says is best? Because to be honest, this book is supposed to be about freedom, but that definition of marriage and sex doesn't sound very free. <laughs> like to our feelings, that doesn't sound like freedom. That sounds restrictive, right? That sounds like keeping me from what I feel like I could do. So what do we do with this gap between what's true and what we feel? And I know we've talked about same-sex attraction, but this is where I wanna cast a wider net to say that sexual sin is any behavior outside of this definition or design. This means that the temptations that you and I feel, maybe you don't struggle with same-sex attraction, but that temptation to say, take a second glance, that temptation to lust, in your heart after someone else, that's Satan saying, did God really say? And trying to break up what God put together. That struggle with pornography, that is the enemy trying to sell you something that, that, that he wants you to believe is better for you than God's definition for sex and for marriage. That struggle to want to sleep with your boyfriend or girlfriend before you've gotten married, that is the, the enemy coming in and saying, did God really say? That, that, and, and that temptation, that temptation to step outside of the covenant of your marriage, this is all the enemy going, did God really say? Same-sex attraction is in the same boat. So if you are here and you've struggled with temptation of any sexual sin, and you think that you are somehow better than someone who has struggled with same-sex attraction, my prayer is that God would overwhelm you with the grace that you need today because you need his grace just as much as somebody who didn't wake up choosing to feel feelings towards the same sex. Yet, there's grace and hope for all of us. And to share that today, I've got a special guest, someone that I'm gonna invite to the platform. This is someone, it's one of about three or four people in my life that I would call in any circumstance, pours wisdom and truth into me, has been an influence, in my life has contributed to many of the sermons that you've heard on this platform because I call him way too much. But this is someone who I am so excited for you to hear and he's gonna be vulnerable with you today as he shares his story. So Foothills, would you warmly welcome my older brother, Brian Robinson, to the platform? Sorry, it's okay, <laughs> forgive you. <clears throat> How's it going? Y'all good? <coughs> oh, <laughs> oh man, <clears throat> excuse my voice. I kind of lost it this week. I think um, in a way the enemy did not want me to speak. 
So um, I felt that a little bit this week. I was like, no, 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 no. As many cough drops as I can get in. So, um, Well, my name is Brian. <clears throat> I'm the middle of the five kids in our family. And uh, yeah, we grew up in a Christian home. And my dad, you know, he's a youth pastor. Some of you probably met my parents. And they're awesome. Uh, we have such a solid foundation in the Lord and in the truth, which is amazing. And when I was seven... I gave my life to the Lord. Like, mm-hmm. I, it was an amazing service. Missionaries were sharing about Africa, and I gave my life to the Lord in that service. So it was, it was sweet. Like, I got to grow up learning scripture and the, the songs and all of that stuff. Um, but what I never shared with anybody is that I was not attracted to girls as, as a boy. Um, that wasn't what my experience. Um, you know, in our, in our church and in that time, like, we didn't talk about sexuality openly, and I just literally didn't know what to do with it. So I was very silent about it. I didn't say a word, uh, and it, and it was it was small at first, you know, as a kid. Then you get into like your preteen puberty years, and everything like it's it's a terrible time, <laughs> you know. Everything exaggerates, um, and around that time in our family's life a lot of of men like church leadership or other people, there was just a lot of pain that was brought to our family. And it was, I think I was about 10. When I remember like the enemy helped me in this for sure, made a vow that said, I will not be like that, those men. And what I did is I cut myself off from masculinity. And I said, masculinity equals pain and it's bad and I don't want any part of it. Well, as a boy, you need other men, older men to pour into you manhood, right? I can't receive that from my mom. I can't receive that from my friends. I need the dads. I need the older brothers. I need, but I shut it off. And really the enemy was there the whole time, like putting that seed of of, um, bitterness and fear into my life. <clears throat> and what the enemy in exchange said, well, you do need that masculinity. Here is pornography. And it was readily available for me. And I just became addicted, you know, as a preteen, teenage years. But again, I didn't say anything to anybody. I'm like by myself um, with this struggle. And, and as a believer, there was so much shame, you know, like anytime there was an altar call, I'm at the front, like weeping, like, Lord, help me take this away. But then a couple days later, you have that draw again, you know, and it's just that addictive cycle. And uh, man, I, I was, I was very alone. And I, and I really wanted the church to talk about it. I really wanted someone to mention it. Like there would be nights in youth group where they would be like, we're gonna have five people give testimonies. And there'd be like a youth leader come up. And I'm like, he's gonna talk about it. And he never talked about it. You know, where you're like, Jesus, please, like, please give me something. Like, I feel like I'm on an island here. <clears throat> and I knew it was wrong but again, like I didn't choose these feelings. It's not like I said, hey, this feels better that, you know, I literally did not know what to do with it. So I went to a camp when I was 16 and there was a man there that, there, there were a bunch of different teachings, but there was a man there that shared his testimony and he had, he had fully lived a gay life and just radically got saved and radically turned to Jesus and when he spoke with us, he, had, he was married, he had two kids. And there was something in me just hearing the, the power of the gospel. There was like a, a dam that broke. And I, I just like, for a couple hours, I just could not stop weeping. Just like, oh my gosh, Lord, like you met me. You heard, like you hear my cry. I'm not alone, you know? And I was like emboldened and I went home and I, I talked to my parents about it. I talked to my brother about it. I talked to youth leaders about it. And, and it was so encouraging and life-giving. <clears throat> and then uh, about a year later, I started college and I was alone again. Mm-hmm. And, and I, it was really the first time in my life that I was confronted with like, I guess the option 
really, like choose life or death, right? So y'all, God just shows up, okay? Like over and over again. So I remember one night, I, or one morning I woke up and I had had a dream. God had given me a dream. Uh, I didn't know it was the Lord, but at the time I, it was like this dream about these two guys that were in the gay lifestyle and they were like, Brian, come with us and let's just go, whatever. We're, we're just gonna like, you know, live that life. And the next day at our chapel service, they talked about sexual purity. And I was like, that's weird. I had a dream and they're talking about sexual purity. Well, two weeks later, I met in person those two guys. And whew, the Lord had warned me. He had, re- he had made me ready. Um, so when I met those guys and we talked, they had told me like, hey, I'm gay. I'm in the, uh, you know, that's who I am. I felt safe. I felt like I could tell them, okay, this is my struggle. And it was such a weird moment, y'all. On one sense, I felt like relief. Like, oh my gosh, like I don't, I don't need to explain anything. Like you get it. And on the other hand, I was, I was trapped. I felt like the, the grip of darkness of like, I have to choose this. I have, it's either I'm all in or I'm all out. And, and I was like in the middle for a couple of months of like trying to have friendship. Like, and those guys, I felt like they held my reputation in their hands. It was a small school. Like if they told people like, it was terrible. And, and it was this weird thing where the enemy like offers you that bit of relief, you know, in the moment, but it's always with a catch. It's always with the catch. And so, um, yeah, I ended up sharing the dream with those guys. And I was like, I can't be friends with you anymore. And I have to leave this school. So I ended up leaving the school and coming back to the city I was li- living in. And, um, you know, I went from, I- I'm, gonna, I'm gonna live out darkness, like whatever. Then I'm gonna try to live out what's right in my own strength. So I started dating a girl. And I was like, totally not attracted to her, but it was like, that's the right thing to do, right? I'm just gonna cover it up and I'm gonna pretend like this is not an issue and and I'm gonna do what everybody wants me to do. I'm gonna get married. And uh, great family, like, but y'all, I was creating havoc in my life around me. And I knew in the depths of my heart, if I was to get married to her, I was going to have an affair. I knew it. Like I knew that I wasn't strong enough against my same sex attraction. You know what I mean? So it, there was just this like depression almost mm. that came over me. Um, that same trapped feeling. So I was trapped in darkness over here from college. And then I was trapped in doing what was right, mm. like in my own flesh. Mm. And it just was like, I was desperate. I, I didn't know where to go. And, and again, the Lord just shows up. Like I started, I had these friends that I kept meeting and all of them just happened to go to the same church. And as I start hearing about this church, there's two men on staff that had come out of this life. And what I felt with this relationship is I was, I was about to ruin this girl's life, you know? And I was like, I've gotta do something. So I ended up meeting with one of the pastors of this church. And I was like, okay, what did you do? Like, what's the quick fix here, you know? And he said, well, do you go to church? I said, no. He was like, would you come to church here? I was like, I, sure, if that helps you, help me, you know? And he was like, okay, if you come to this church, I would love to meet with you. We'll meet on a weekly basis, I'll mentor you. Well, we start meeting, right? Uh, and he's like, first of all, you gotta break up with this girl. And I was like, crap, <laughs> like, <laughs> I know, you know? And it was so hard. And, and, and then the first six weeks, y'all, all he talked about was the gospel. And I was so mad. And I was like, I'm not here to talk about the gospel. I'm here to talk about homosexuality and you're gonna fix me. What is it, you know? And it, it, he was like, no, we've gotta find out, do you really know Jesus? do you know Jesus? And from that place, there was this introduction, like, y'all, I remember I met with them and I, I, um, 
just, you know, where the Lord's like, hey, I'm gonna make you really vulnerable. So I meet with him and I'm like, hey, I'm gonna go start going to this church. He goes, great, I'm gonna introduce you to everybody. He's the pastor on staff that meets with people who are coming out of homosexuality. I was meeting with him and then he's introducing me to all these strangers. And he's like, this is Brian. And I'm like, everyone knows, everyone knows my secret, you know? But what it did is I started introducing myself to people like in our young adults group. I was like, hi, I'm Brian. I meet with Jeff Buchanan. I'm here because I deal with homosexuality. What's your story? (laughs) And there was just this freedom, y'all, like a freedom to say, I'm broken and I need Jesus now. And those people would be like, awesome. I was addicted to drugs and I need Jesus. Or they say, I was addicted to alcohol and I need Jesus. Or I was just, I just got divorced because I cheated on my wife. I need Jesus. And we started all out pursuing Jesus, like with everything that we had, because we, we had nothing else. You know, I had nothing else to go to. So when, as I start pursuing Jesus, my identity went from being, I deal with homosexuality to I'm a worship leader. Mm. The, the gifts that God had put in me started coming up and I started leading worship. I started going on mission trips and I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm alive. Like I need to be leading mission trips. I need to be doing this. And this like life, this abundant life shows up. And, and it was like, we get to call it out within this community with one another of like, brother, you're a pastor. You're a businessman. You're a father. You know, where it's like, gee, just that abundant life. The enemy was gonna try to steal, right? But Jesus offered life and life abundant. And I'm, as I'm going and I'm pursuing Jesus, I'm running after him. It kind of felt like one day, I kind of realized there's, there's this girl, like, her heart is like my heart. We, we, love, we love the same things, and we're, like, broken about the same things, and, like, I think I'm attracted to her. Is this what it's like? <laughs> oh, my goodness. And I, I start realizing, like, oh, my goodness, Lord, I think, I th- I think you're drawing me to Angela. And... Y'all, this was like a girl that was like high level leader, untouchable kind of person. And I'm like, no, who am I to even like pursue this girl? And I started talking with friends and leaders. They were like, oh, I see it. I see it. I was like, I'm scared to death. I don't don't know what to do with this, you know? And uh, a few months go by and we start a relationship. And y'all, I've been married for nine years. Nine years. I think we have a picture of my family. Yeah, we have three kids. It's like one thing, you know, that my wife is such a gift, but then you have kids and you're like, oh my goodness. (laughs) Excuse me. Uh, Man. And then I look back and I go, 20 years ago, I heard the first testimony about this. and I felt hope for the first time. Because the Lord knew 20 years ago that those three kids were to be born. There's much more at stake here than just how I feel in the moment. There's so much more at stake here. There is a, there's a call of God on my life and my wife's life. And this is part of it, to share our story and to say, and when we got together, I said, babe, if, if this is something you're called to, this becomes your story. It becomes our story. And you know what she said? She goes, I know, I'm in. And her, her middle name, her name is Angela. Her middle name is Grace. And we're talking about grace and truth. And I felt like I was in a place of truth where I was like, the truth sets me free. And the gift of grace came in and said, I'm with you. And God, you guys, God, and I see him, he showed up so many times throughout my story and continues to do so. Y'all, he's here today. Amen. He's here today. If, if you feel like he, he's left you, or if you feel like you've been waiting or hoping in him, let my story be a sign. Let my story be comfort to your heart and peace that God 
he's not only with, he's working. And we sing the song like Waymaker all the time. Even when I don't see it, you're working. It's so true. But I wanna say to you this morning, see it. See it. Look at me and see it. Look at my wife and see it. He's working. Amen. Come on, church. Come on. It's amazing. And, and like um, Brian and I, we've been talking about this message for a while. And um, dude, I'm so grateful you came and shared. Um, but we've been talking about the fact that, that like even your family is, is a gift. But yeah. the prize has always been Jesus. Yeah, that's right. Like Jesus was the, tra- that's right. yeah, Jesus was the, that's right. the transformation. Yeah. The call was to follow him. And then, like you said, yeah. then the abundant life that's comes. Right. Yep. And, and for some today, I believe that that's the call. That's right. For some today, I believe the call is to follow Jesus. Yep. Some of you have been wrestling with this and you may not deal with anything we've talked about today, but you may have struggles that you feel that you feel are too much for God to handle. You may have struggles that you feel or mistakes that you've made that you feel have placed you out of the grasp of God's grace and his mercy and his love. But the Bible tells us that his kindness leads us to repentance. I believe that this testimony is a kindness call to you to follow yeah. Jesus today. And I believe that, that, that today, you can offer Jesus your life and receive yes. the free gift of salvation. He is pursuing you. Yep. That's why this story is being shared yep. today. So in a moment, if that's you, we're gonna give you an opportunity to give your life to Jesus. But we're also gonna take some time to pray um, because while this is a story of victory in our family, we've also got other stories in our family. Yeah. We've got family members and friends who have not chosen life in yeah. Jesus or that abundant life, who are still buying the lie from the enemy. Remember what Paul said? They traded the truth of God yeah. for a lie. We've got that in our own family. And we're in this tension moment where we're still crying out to God on behalf of our loved ones. And many of you may have loved ones that you're crying out yeah. to God for. And so what I wanna do, I'm gonna invite, our prayer teams are coming up right now. We've got pastors that are gonna come up and, and line the front of, of the platform here. When we dismiss in a moment, if you want prayer today, we want you to come forward and receive prayer. We'll dismiss, and, and this, this will just turn into a room, yeah. a house of prayer for a little bit. And I know like when our family has walked through stuff, the thought to have a church where we could come and talk about it and receive prayer, yeah. my soul was longing for that, it was longing for support. And so we wanna offer that for yeah. you today if you've got a loved one. But also, if you're carrying something, a struggle, sexual sin in your life or any sin that totally. you wanna come up and receive prayer and you wanna confess and repent today. We wanna offer that opportunity for you. All of these people that are up here for prayer have been impacted by this exact issue within a family member or in their own past and history. And so we're ready, we're ready to, to pray with you. So church, would you join us as we pray? We're gonna offer a salvation prayer, then I'm gonna pray for your loved ones, and then Brian's gonna close us by praying over you, and then we'll, uh, we'll open the platform. Yeah. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we give you the glory for what you are doing today. We give you the glory for this day that you set in motion long before we were aware of it. Jesus, this has been your plan in the making for a very long time. Yes, God. And Jesus, while we're, we're just up here opening your word and, and sharing the hope that's in a testimony, Jesus, we know that you're pursuing hearts here in this room, that there are people here in this room who have heard the hope that they didn't know was there. Right. They've heard of a hope that's alive and active. They've heard of a truth and they wonder if it brings true freedom. And Jesus, you're wooing them. You're calling their hearts. I pray today for a response of surrender. And if you wanna surrender your life and follow Jesus, I wanna give you an opportunity. You may pray a prayer with me just like this. Say, Jesus, I am broken. I am a sinner. 
and my sin has separated me from my creator, from God. But Jesus, I trust and believe that you came after me. Yes, God. That you came here to earth and you lived the perfect life that I could not. But you willingly took my punishment on the cross when you died for my sins. And I believe that God raised you from the dead. So today, I surrender my life. Save me from my sins, Jesus. I will follow you from this day forward. And Lord, I pray, I pray for those of us in this room that have a loved one, have a friend or a family member that have traded your truth for a lie. Yes, Jesus. Lord, would you teach us how to walk in grace and truth? Yes, Jesus. Where we need one or the other, would you help? If we're all the way on grace with no truth, would you teach us what it looks like to, to lovingly grab a hold of truth? And Lord, where we're all truth with no grace, Lord, would you break our hearts with compassion? Yes, God. Would you remind us that our loved one is not the enemy, that there is an enemy who's lying to them? Right. Yes, God. Would you overwhelm us with grace and mercy so that we can love with grace and truth? God, we need it. We also need wisdom. We need wisdom for how to navigate this relationship. So God, I pray that over my brothers and sisters in this room today. God, I can't, I can't get out of my head the story of the woman with the issue of blood who had done literally everything in her power to deal with the sickness that she knew was in her. And she had spent all her resources and she had gone to every doctor and there was no cure. And she got desperate. And she said, I have to touch the hem of the garment of Jesus because I know that he will heal me. God, and I, I pray in this room right now that there would be a wave of desperation yes, over every person who feels trapped in sexual sin. Yes, Lord. If they feel trapped in pornography or if they feel trapped in a relationship or they feel trapped in same-sex attraction, whatever it is, God, and they've tried everything and nothing's worked, Jesus, you are here. Yes. You are in this place. And I pray boldness right now, God, over every person that needs freedom. Yes. Boldness to run to you yes. and say, I don't care what people think. Right. I don't care what they're gonna say. I need to touch the hem of his garment right now. Yes. And Lord, I pray that you touch them and they'd be healed. Yes. Their hearts would be healed. Yes. Their minds would be healed. Their souls would be healed. Yes. In Jesus' name, we thank you, God, that you are here and you are moving in your name, Jesus, we pray. Wasn't that a powerful sermon by Pastor Kevin? Such a sensitive topic, hot button topic, but he did a great job. We, have, we know exactly what the Bible says about a marriage between a man and, and a woman. I hope that you enjoyed that. I hope that it was fruitful and that God will use that in your life. Um, today, if you became a Christian, if you gave your life to the Lord, we want to know about it. We want to help you take, take next steps. Now you get to be baptized and you get to be discipled. Um, please let us know right down there in the comments um, that God saved you today and a pastor will reach back out to you and let you know kind of what your next step are. And so guys, thank you again so much for joining us. We hope that you have a great week and we'll see you next time.